So just in case you thought we hadn't been ambitious enough in our coverage so far, we're going to end the morning with a discussion on the question of how will AI change the world? <laughs> so to moderate that, we have the brave Lila Janna, who is the founder of uh, Samosos. And I'd like to introduce her and her panelists. Please, come on. So, we have Joel Mokia, who's an economic historian from Northwestern University. Jewel Razak, who is the president of the International Association of Universities. We have Cynthia Brizel from the MIT Media Lab and also the founder of Jibo Inc., social robotics company, and Michael Levitt, who's the 2013 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry from Stanford University. Leila. <laughs> I recognize that we're the panel just before lunch, so we're going to try to keep this very lively and interesting and make it a conversation. Most of the discussion around AI focuses on how it pushes the boundary on innovation and technological progress. I would love us to talk about how it affects people living at the bottom of the pyramid. People who are not wearing Apple watches, people who are not working for unicorns in places like Silicon Valley or Sweden. Let's talk about how these uh, advances will impact them. And, and Michael, let's start with you. And I apologize in advance. Uh, we're going to try to keep our remarks to a minute or so. So I apologize in advance for possibly interrupting a Nobel laureate. <laughs> so uh, in, in keeping with the lightness, I wanted to start with a joke I heard recently from my daughter-in-law. This is a list for the school trip, which could be at any school in the world right now. Camera, not needed. It's on the smartphone. Torch. Not needed, it's on your smartphone. Compass, not needed, it's on your smartphone. Map, music, alarm clock, games, newspapers, guidebooks, television. Finally, a good mood. Not needed because everyone is buried in their smartphone. <laughs> so what is needed? A charger. I think this thing <laughs> has changed the world more than almost anything is going to. I'm done. That's a great point. Joel, you had, you had similar comments this morning. Yeah, I mean, we talk a great deal about inequality in this world, and every economist rec recognizes how bad it is. But we also have to understand that in some ways, technology is a great equalizer, and that in that regard, very few things have changed the developing world as much as the cell phone because the cell phone allowed, it, allowed people to build networks of communication without the expensive infrastructure uh, of, of setting up an, an, a landline phone system. And the way cell phones have changed the, uh, places like Africa or Southern Asia is impossible to imagine for somebody uh, living in the developed world because they are everywhere. People do banking, people find jobs, people find employees, people find plumbers. Everything is done on a cell phone. And in that regard, it's really, we really should think long and hard about how much technology is an equalizing factor, not only between developing and underdeveloping countries, but you know, the news is you know, that the, the richest man in America, or the second richest man is somebody called Sheldon Adelson. He and I have exactly the same smartphone, and there is nothing that he can do in spending $28 billion to get a better smartphone. We have the same smartphone. Technology is a great equalizer, both within countries and between countries. And in that regard, I'm, I'm a great optimist, because as I see technology going forward, I see many of the gaps, not all unfortunately, but many of the gaps between rich and poor slowly shrinking. And that is the best news, I think, of this century. Zul, you work with professors across the developing world. Do you agree with this statement? I mean, we still have millions of people who don't have access to electricity at home, who don't have access to high-speed bandwidth or smartphones. Tell us what you think. Well, I, I think it is a question of how it changes depending on what conditions are we talking about. I want to go back to what Gandhi used to say, what he calls the seven social blunders that we need to be mindful of. Three of which I think is related to the discussion today. One is when he says, we do, we do science without humanity. As we escalate humanity using science, is science concerned about the livelihood of people at large? 
We are not talking about just a group of persons. We are talking a whole population, what we call the bottom billions. Are they affected by science without humanity? The second issue is perhaps knowledge without wisdom. The earlier, earlier panel talked about wisdom, and I like the word. They need to be factored in when we talk about technology. Where is wisdom in this, all this technology? We may have knowledge, but there's wisdom embedded in that technology at the same time. And it's certainly an issue that is very related to AI uh, in, in this particular context. And last but not least, as we see more science being funded by private sector, the whole issue of business without ethics. Uh, the, 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 the outcome or the goal of science and the goal of business may not necessarily be the same. And therefore, we want to know whether ethics do influence the way science develop, depending on the funding, depending on the kind of uh, negotiation that we do at the, at the same time. So in the developing countries, we discuss this quite a lot. For example, when we talk about science without ethics, this year we celebrate the 70th anniversary of the explosion of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There is already a question for us, where is humanity when we develop that particular bomb and how come it is repeated twice, one in Hiroshima and one in Nagasaki? What happened to science at that particular point in time? When we talk about knowledge with wisdom, the whole idea of climate change and, and, and global warming, the COP21, is there a disconnect between science and wisdom at that particular point? It is something that the question that we need to ask. So, so these are issues that I think which is important. I'm going to, I think this is a great transition into Cynthia's work. Uh, she's known mostly as a roboticist, but we were talking a little bit about her work on education. Yeah, so I'd like to restrict my comments to thinking about a profound positive impact that AI can have, particularly when we speak about education for all. And I just wanted to highlight one particular project because I think it brings it all into to color. We know that personal tutoring is much more effective for learning outcomes than the sort of lecture hall style of information. And with AI and with the ability to track how children engage with digital materials, we have AIs that can create personalized models in terms of understanding what children understand, what do they understand, what is that point of information or knowledge they're on the cusp of understanding. So you can start to deliver a highly personalized learning experience. So right now I'm involved in a project called the Curious Learning Initiative um, that involves multiple institutions um, where we are creating an open platform, an AI platform for education specifically for the most under-resourced children because of the proliferation of technology, of the affordability, of the scalability, we're actually able to deploy and study these systems in the most extreme learning situations. We're talking about villages in Ethiopia so far from schools that the children can't go to school. We're talking about school classes in South Africa where the student to teacher ratio is 80 to 1. Or even in impoverished areas in the United States where not every child can go to preschool because they don't have enough preschool slots. It's done by lottery. And we've been studying how this technology can be deployed in these systems with extremely positive results, where for us the killer app right now is literacy. So when we think about the spreading of the internet and technology, literacy is really becoming critical, and education is absolutely becoming as much of a fundamental right as food, clothing, and shelter. So a lot of opportunity here, and I think all of the technological trends, we now have a corpus of children learning with this technology across all of these countries that we can learn how they engage with this technology, how they learned in these different contexts. So a huge wealth of scientific opportunity as well. And what we're finding is it's a highly social process. It's not the case of children with their nose in a tablet. They're sharing, they're talking. It's children bringing natural learning processes supported by technology in a way that's leading to positive learning outcomes. So I see huge huge, tremendous potential for education for all with, with AI. I'd like us to, th to talk a little bit about this issue of, of science and empathy. Michael, you're a scientist. How do you think we should think about empathy in the scientific context? And especially as we're, as we're developing some of these new systems, you know, in Silicon Valley, we tend to think about the bottom line or increasing innovation. Empathy doesn't usually factor into those discussions very early on in the process. So I would say that uh, I'm gonna talk about this not a lot of Silicon Valley is applied science. I'm going to think about this in terms of basic science. And I think uh, my guess is that many, many basic sciences, the successful ones, are pretty much uh, maybe not autistic, but not necessarily <laughs> socially very skilled. Being a geek really makes a difference. Essentially, you have to be focused on something which you, cannot, you can't hardly explain to anybody. And if you did, they wouldn't really be at all interested. So in some senses, in basic science, you're out there on the frontier, 
picking away for bits of information that make no sense at all when you get them. Uh, I think in my case, I'm probably super autistic, but I got married when I was 20, <laughs> and now I have six grandchildren and a wife and three children that made a huge difference. But I do think that this is one of the problems that uh, very often a basic scientist can't even say what it's going to be good for, but he doesn't know. And I think we have to realize, and this goes back to what you were saying, a lot of the ethics here comes from thinking you know what's going to happen. But if you look at this, so many things that have happened happen in an unexpected way. Maybe the trends are predictable, but exactly what happens is extremely unexpected. And I think that, uh, uh, so I think actually basic scientists, also in the world, there's been a big move away from basic science. So most countries are now talking about translational research, applied research. And that's very dangerous because if you know where you're going, you're not going to find something really interesting. In some ways, you've got to say to somebody, go out and do something that no one really understands and find it. So I think the empathy is, uh, I don't know, empathy is a completed issue. And uh, I, I don't even know how empathetic I am. My wife would probably say very non-empathetic, but uh, that's why I have a wife. <laughs> At least you're self-aware. <laughs> Would anybody else like to comment on that? <laughs> Not on Michael's empathy or lack thereof, but on the general topic. <laughs> I think um, there is an active dialogue going on now. So I, I, I'm an innovator. Um, I create technologies, but really around what are the values, the humanistic values that we apply when we create these technologies. And I think as we understand now that we have supercomputers in our pockets and so forth, um, really trying to understand how can these systems be deployed in a way, how can they be designed in a way that really promotes human flourishing, really, to think beyond the kind of efficacy and the utility, to really think about how it impacts real people's lives versus the few specialists or scientists or whatnot, to so really think about everyone. And I, I hear much more of that open dialogue happening now, which I think is absolutely critical. So, you know, as an economist, you always worry about one thing, and that is that much of the direction in which science and technology are going are uh, determined by market forces. And uh, the real question that we really have to ask ourselves deeply is, do we really wish to rely on what markets decide in terms of where science and technology are going. And there are very good reasons uh, to think that that may not be the case, that in, this is the classic case in which markets needs nudging from politicians, from public opinions, from people outside the market, philosophers, ethicists, and so on and so forth. And so we re it really matters that a lot of research should go into things like malaria, schistosomiasis, and diseases like that that affect millions of people in poor countries, rather than on the research on Botox for you know, wealthy American women. But that is, unfortunately, where a lot of money is. <laughs> or, or impotence drugs for wealthy American men, and just to be fair. <laughs> 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 <Sorry>. <laughs> Touché. Thank you. <laughs> but, 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 but the main point <laughs> is, and I said this with some regret, because I'm an economist, and, and roughly speaking, I'm trained to believe in markets. But it's important to be able to step aside and say, in this particular case, we should not rely on markets. And then the question, of course, is, well, who should we rely on? And unfortunately, I think the quality of our public servants, particularly, I'm afraid, in the United States these days, hasn't always lived up to the expectations that we need to supplement the market. And so we have really the choice between two rather unattractive alternatives. One of them is the market uh, uh, dictum, with, uh, you know, backed up by money, and the other is politicians who are worrying about votes. Uh, and, and neither of those, unfortunately, are perfect. And so we will not get the best of all possible worlds, ladies and gentlemen. We'll just muddle through. Some, some pessimism from the, opt from the tech optimist. This is surprising, Zul. <laughs> I think the question that was raised is very relevant to, to developing countries that you want to do science. The kinds of science that we do normally comes in from what the developed country does. We always look at what is quote unquote current in the world at large and we try to imitate them. You know, sometimes resources are, are a big problem. As you, as you see, malaria, dysentery, diarrhea, these are age old diseases 
which is still proliferating in many developing countries. You know, and I'm so happy that the Nobel laureate for, for phys uh, physiology and medicine this year goes to a person who worked on artem artemisinin, a natural product that comes from you know, herbs uh, for malaria control. I mean, these are the kind of research that I think is relevant, quote unquote, for developing countries to move ahead. Unless we get this done, technology will be secondary to us. I would also add that there are new models of fundraising that are happening now, crowdfunding being one of them, where now people as individuals can kind of vote with their pocketbook in terms of what projects they deem to be interesting and important. Um, and it often gives young startups the ability, or nonprofits to kind of get a foothold going, and then hopefully they can scale and, and raise the money from there. So um, this is a space that I do think needs a lot of innovation, um, but I think democratizing that process is one potential step that's, that's helping. We have a question from the audience. Uh, this is taking the conversation in a slightly different direction, but perhaps we can end on this more funny note. Uh, will AI make people lazy? Michael. So, so uh, I, you know, people before said the GPSs would make us unable to travel. I think quite the reverse. I, uh, really like learning new ways to go to places, and I, I don't see any reason why AI should make us lazy. Um, I think that uh, smartphones are actually quite stimulating, and uh, you know, I, I think that we might, I mean, the bigger danger is being hit by a car while you cross the road doing email, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, otherwise I don't think so. Yeah, as an economist, I do not recognize words like lazy. I only know leisure preference. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that in my lifetime, and I'll give you an idea of, of how long I've been around, what was one of the things, the revolutionary changes that were introduced were calculating machines. I'm not talking computers, I'm just basically machines that allow you to multiply, divide, uh, uh, add and subtract. And uh, people always said, well, if you introduce those machines, will people not lose their knowledge of arithmetic? And now we have computers that allow us to run regressions and do, and do computer pro programming and so on. So don't we lose the ability to think? And the answer is no. I don't think AI makes us lazy. What AI will do is it will take our energies and channel them in more productive, more effective directions because somebody is gonna do the grudge work for us. That, I think, is a big step forward. P machinery doesn't make people lazy. It just redirects their energy, usually in more productive ways. In that sense, I am a great optimist. Yeah. Yeah, in that sense, I agree with you. But who directs AI is an issue. I mean, we talk about handphones, smartphones, fine. But there was a study that shows in a, in a particular country, there's more people who have handphones than public toilets. So public solid is still an issue in that particular country, but then there are a lot of people with handphones. So we don't see the balance at all as where technology is taking. That's where the basic human needs are not even taken into account as far as technology is concerned. So, I mean, I, I agree that the opportunity is the affordability and scalability of technology that hopefully over time that will correct itself. And I do think it needs to be an intentional design choice as we create these technologies. Um, to make sure, again, they support our human values. And I do think people are inherently, we're curious, we seek out meaning in our lives. I, I don't think AI is gonna make us lazy. I think we are driven by these things that lead to a rich, fulfilling life. And I think we will leverage these technologies to facilitate our ability to do so. Great, so I will uh, ask us to end with just a uh, one line kind of summary of your view on how AI will impact humanity and think of it in terms of uh, a tweet, so maybe 140 characters max. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a tweeter, but uh, I would just say that uh, technology is a great opportunity, just go with it. I would say that technology needs to be intentionally designed to promote human flourishing. I would agree also that, but it needs to be balanced where the human consideration becomes an important issue. And for all of those who think that the low hanging fruits of technology have been picked and that we've made all the easy inventions and now it gets harder and harder, my prediction is you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>